You know, there's been a lot of talk here recently, um, probably because of me, about real life lineups, whether it's important to use them or not, uh, and exactly uh, how we should uh, we should approach this subject as a community, right? Is it good for us to use just the same uh, lineups that were used in real life for every single game, or should we construct our own lineups when we're uh, playing through our seasons? And is there something that we lose in terms of accuracy if we make our own lineups? And let's say, I don't know, we put in uh, uh, Nellie Fox for the 1949 Athletics at second base uh, because he's a better hitter. Or um, is there something that is better for us if we use the exact thing, same thing that was done in real life so that no player gets over their plate appearances, no player has too many at-bats, and so on and so forth. Usually when we're talking about this, there's this assumption that exists, that real-life lineups are like the perfect thing to have, that this is the best way to replay, and that this is the most realistic thing you can do. But what we don't realize is that Commonly in the history of baseball, we run into circumstances in which the real life lineups are a joke or would be totally unrealistic in certain situations. And so, because of that, this is a new series in which we're going to start talking every week about an example of a game in which real life lineups will hurt your replay. The first one here is going to be pretty obvious. So, this comes from the Cincinnati Inquirer, October 5th, 1902, page 10. Baseball, farcical was season's close. Reds compelled to play on Swampy Field. Turned the game into a diamond comedy. <laughs> so we'll just go through and read this. I know it's a little bit tricky to read, so I'll read some of this here for you. The red uh, colors were lowered at Exposition Park this afternoon, but not by the Pirates. Cincinnati's abject surrender to Pittsburgh provided a farcical finish to the championship season. On a field that resembled a swamp, the Pirates compelled the Reds to meet them. An all-night rain had soaked the grounds, and it was still drizzling at noon. The order to report, however, reached the Monongahela, and a hastily connected plan, a conceived plan of turning the game into a comedy was carried out. Instead of battling to defend the object of the Pittsburgh team to establish a world's record, and by doing so defend their own uncertain footing in the first division, the Reds simply handed over the game that gave Pittsburgh the coveted 106. No one would have recognized the team that took the field for Cincinnati. Let me repeat that. No one would have recognized the team that took the field for Cincinnati. And yet had Hettiz started behind Beckley. I'm sorry, I'm not very um, familiar with the 1902 Reds, who went in to show them how he pitched in Missouri years ago. The farce may have been more like a tragedy for Pittsburgh, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Treated as a game of ball, the story isn't worth 10 lines. Yeah, that's it's good when your uh, journalists are saying that. I'll go over here and look at this and give you a quick look at this and we'll have a much better looking uh, version of this. But this is what the Cincinnati box score was like. So Pittsburgh had Beaumont, Clark, Leach, Wagner. We know about all this. I've played around with this a lot. This is what the Pirates looked like in 1900, right? Cincinnati had Donlin and then Beckley pitching, hitting second. And then had just this totally crazy thing. Kelly, Seymour, Corcoran, everybody was playing out of position. We'll see a little bit more here when we look at the Pittsburgh Post. So, uh, you know, the uh, Pirates are uh, bowing to themselves. Should have been not 106, but 103 games and the record. Right? Champions wallop the Reds and win the 103rd game. <laughs> no money for the visitors. I wonder what exactly was going on. The baseball season closed in Pittsburgh yesterday, not exactly in a blaze of glory. There was glory in the performance of the Pittsburgh team, which won the game and broke all records for games won in a season. They tallied 108, is that what that says, victories? 103 is what it should be, 103 victories, one more than was won by any team in the history of baseball. And that right there we should put some emphasis on, right? The Pirates wanted to play this game not because the field was in great shape, but because they wanted to get the record, right? So don't come around telling me that in 1900 or whatever, nobody knew about this. They knew what the record was. They wanted it. 
The day was gloomy and the ground soggy, and therefore only about 1,200 people saw the record-breaking performance. They also saw the Reds of Cincinnati lose a great deal of their growing popularity in this town. Yeah, right. The Reds did not want to play, claiming the grounds were not in condition. Under the rules, the captain of the home team is the sole judge of the fitness of the grounds, which is ridiculous. Captain Clark decided that a game should be played, and a game was played. Then the Reds, led by manager Joe Kelly, resorted to tactics which made a farce of the game and are bound to get them in trouble. Kelly sent his men into the field with not a man in his regular position. Beckley and Vickers were the battery, while the infield consisted of Hahn at first, Cochran at second, Seymour at third, and Donlin at short. In the outfield were Morrissey, Kelly, and Steinfeld. The whole team swaggered around like toughs who had a grievance against good society. They smoked cigarettes with brazen effrontery. Kelly, Donlin, and Seymour blowing the smoke into the air offensively. One of Seymour's stockings hung over his shoe, and Donlin wore his cap recklessly on the side of his head. Kelly walked into the box with a cigarette in his mouth and puffed away while the ball was being pitched. Vickers, behind the bat, had six pass balls, which seemed to give the Reds great pleasure. He sometimes raised a mirthful howl from his fellows by blowing his nose before going after the ball and using his handkerchief with great care and deliberation. <laughs> and then this sort of thing went on for two innings when President Dreyfus became wrothy and on and on and on. He announced that the spectators would be given their money back as they had gone to the park to see a championship game and not a farce. He declined to pay the Cincinnati club a cent and the Reds left for home last night with the mere statement in their possession of how many paid admission there were. Um, interesting stuff. But now when we go here and we look at this, now remember, this is before the peace, right? This is when the National League and American League were duking it out. This didn't happen in the American League, I'll tell you that. We go here and take a look at this. Yeah, this is what the box score looks like. You had Donlin starting at short and then pitching. Beckley pitching and then going to first. The whole thing was just a total farce. I Seymour also pitched in this game. Um, the uh, Pirates scored 14, or I'm sorry, 11 runs, got 14 hits. They somehow gave up uh, two runs. I'm not quite sure how. And Philippi won his uh, 20th. We'll take a quick look at some of these players and give you sort of an idea of where these guys originally were. Uh, because um, as I know that you're probably like me, you probably don't know all of this like you know, you don't have this all memorized. So Mike Donlin uh, in the field, usually in uh, 1902, um, he was uh, generally an outfielder. He played outfield most of the time. In this game, he started at shortstop in his only game of the season at short. He'd played there before, and then he went into pitch. So the shortstop and pitching performance came in the same game. All right, next you have Jake Beckley. Beckley was a first baseman. He comes in this game pitching. Right? If we go look at his standard pitching record. This is the only time he ever pitched. He started one game, pitched four innings. Right? You see what I'm saying? Right? Up next, Joe Kelly. Kelly uh, started off playing center field. He actually was a left fielder first baseman, right? If we go look at what he was doing in 1902, yeah, he was playing center field and uh, did play left field a couple of times, also played third base. So it's not totally out of the question. Remember, he's one of the players who uh, hopped back from the um, American League to the National League. Um, uh, which is interesting. He had been part of the Orioles uh, before uh, all the fun happened with uh, John McGraw. Cy Seymour, um, center fielder, um, ended up starting at third base. All right, so again, we'll go take a look at his fielding. And when you see what this is, yeah, he had one appearance at third base and one appearance pitching. He had pitched a little bit before then, but he was not a pitcher by this time. So it was a force. Harry Steinfeld, right fielder in this game. He was actually originally the third baseman or second baseman. And again, when we look at the fielding, um, he had um, in uh, 1902 um, one appearance in the outfield, and that was his game. All right next up, Jack Morrissey. Morrissey started this game in left field. Um, for the most part, his fielding record is a little bit easier. He had one appearance and left and 11 at second. He was actually their second baseman at the time. So when Baseball Reference tells you he was a left fielder, like barely, I mean, he may have made a couple of token appearances in the outfield in his two incomplete seasons of play, right? You have to be careful with this. You have to look at where the game took place and what was going on. Here is Tommy Kokoran, who started at second. Um, now, did he actually start that much at second in 1902? No, he started at short. He was the shortstop. That's not going to be hard for him to play second. He had played second earlier in his career. Rube Vickers. Vickers was the catcher. He was a pitcher. 
right? And when we look at his fielding record, which is right here, we see that he had one performance in his major league career at catcher. He also played in center field for Brooklyn once in 1903 for some strange reason. Vickers was the catcher, right? And he gave up six pass balls, like they said. And then at the end comes Noodles Hahn, who, of course, is a pitcher. He was playing first base. We go take a look at this. Um, uh, here are the standard fielding, fielding appearances. He had one at first base and also played in the outfield once. And so there you have it. That's how crazy this lineup was. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because sometimes the real-life lineups are not realistic. Sometimes this sort of weird thing happens, right? The Reds were pissed off in this game. They were upset because they had to go play a game so the Pirates could have the joy of defeating them again and getting themselves to uh, whatever it was, 103 victories, which set the record at the time. And to, you know, to have the record for the highest winning percentage of um, all time and, and so on and so forth, right? But it was an absolute joke. It's an absolute farce. If you're playing the 1902 season and somehow the Pirates are in a pennant race since the last day of the season and you use this lineup, there's a problem. You can't do that, right? That's not realistic. That's not right. If I read a replay that had a close pennant race in the National League and they used this lineup for the last game of the season, I'm going to be really upset because it's not the way it's supposed to work. Now, the other thing you notice is that with these really old teams, you know, you'll see on your card, doesn't matter what game you play with, you see that the guy has like five positions listed. Yeah, when you go look at the record, you see the guy played once of the position. Look closely, you might discover it was on the last game of the season and they were just kind of, you know, having fun and, and goofing off and doing stuff like that. Which leads us to ask, should the guy get that ra rating at that fielding position or not? Anyway, this is just one example of the problems with real-life lineups, and trust me, we have a lot more coming up. So stay tuned. We're going to have a lot more of, of this for you in the future. I'll talk with you later. Take care. Bye-bye.